We are live. Welcome to 1980s The Exterminator Review and Thoughts. So, I'm going to tell you, this was a movie that I liked a lot. I wouldn't quite say loved, but it comes very close. And the, yeah, the video will have, I hesitate to say a lot of jokes of, um, there will definitely be jokes especially in the in the first thoughts section and I will get some into some serious stuff in this video and yeah so I realize this video is long I'm gonna do what I can to make it worth your time and uh, yeah content warning and or trigger warning for vigilantism torture kidnapping ableism Let's see, xenophobia, murder, body horror, euthanasia, mourning, and uh, yeah, rape and pedophilia. And yeah, so the movie is rated R, and so is this video, and this is one of those movies, there aren't any details on the MPA, the IMDb, for why the MPA rated it the way, but yeah, I would definitely say it's the violence, there's some sex and nudity as well, and, and some swearing, but primarily the, the violence, you know, it's a, it's a hard R. And uh, regardless of how you feel about this movie, I don't hate you. I don't think that you're, you know, if we disagree on something, I don't think you're stupid. And let's see. Yeah, and the, the review itself will have no spoilers. And once I get into the thought sections, I will have tons of spoilers. I am not currently planning on reviewing the second movie. I don't own a copy. I've never watched it. And I hear it's not as good as this. And let's see. So that brings us to um, let's see. Yeah, so since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you I washed my hands since last time I was outside and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, the version I'm going off for this video is the director's cut. I haven't watched any other version. And yeah, I watched it once in 2004 and I watched it again like uh, I got done watching it like maybe 10 minutes ago. And let's see, so yeah, the plot, I am just going to quote some of the IMDb plot summary. A man's best friend is killed on the streets of New York City. The man, Robert Ginty, then transforms into a violent killer, turning New York City into a great war zone. And the cop played by Christopher George is the only one who could possibly stop him. So, the, yeah, um, five years long subscriber and frequent commenter Arts Cafe requested this in the comment section of my Punisher 1989 video, so here I am, and, you know, I try to get to all requests that follow the rules, I can't always get to them this quickly one week after the request was made, but not, there, there are not that many reviews to read through for this one, so, yeah. I own this DVD because it was gifted to me by my friend Peter. I will link his channels in the description box. Peter, if there is one of your channels that I forgot to link to, please let me know in, in the comments and I will add it. And let's see, that brings us to... Yeah, so the writing for this movie was handled by James Glickenhaus, who has written nine movies and directed, let's 
see. Um, did I really not? Grab oh, here we go. Yeah. <clears throat> and he, d d yeah, the only feature that he's credited as writer on that he didn't direct is Exterminator 2, and he didn't write it. They just use characters he wrote for this. It, it says characters. I'm not sure anybody but Robert Ginty himself is in the second. I don't know. Maybe. And yeah. Um, some of his most recent movies feature one or more of his own kids, which that's one way to save money. And let's see, yeah, um, of the nine movies, there's only one, 1993's Slaughter of the Innocents, where the title isn't just one word that evokes an image, possibly preceded by a uh, the. You know, the other ones are Time Master, McBain, Shakedown, The Protector, Exterminator 2, The Exterminator, The Astrologer, uh, oh, right, yeah, that's, that's all of them. And, uh, yeah, this, this and McBain are the only ones th that he has written and or directed that I've watched. I really don't remember much of McBain. I don't think it was quite as good as this. You know, but, yeah, he definitely has a vision. He has a, a very clear, uh, what's the word, like, um, director's fingerprint. You know, you can you can recognize his, his movies. Uh, right, and, yeah, he also did um, produce some movies, including some that he did. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll take very long James Gilligan House. Who produced? Let's see. Yeah, he he has seven credits as producer, and let's see. Yeah, yeah, he he produced Maniac Cop one, Basket Case two and three, Frankenhooker, Ring of Steel, Tough and Deadly, The Soldier. Which yeah, the soldier is the only of his own movies that he that that he wrote and directed and also produced. And he's an actor in five movies and let's see yeah one of them is one that he didn't write direct or produce called Bad Biology yeah. He does not appear in this movie although the the producer. Ah, uh, hold on. Yeah, um, I forget his name, but it, the the produce you know, he, Mark Buntsman helped produce this movie, and he wrote and directed the second one. Right, and he shares the directing credit with William Sachs, and then James Glicknow's four characters, and. Yeah, um, it's it's fairly easy to find Mark Buntsman, which I appreciate. Uh, who you know who he plays in the first Exterminator because he is, yeah, he's credited as burping ghoul, and there is indeed only one ghoul who burps in this movie, and he is sufficiently just, yeah, re repulsive. And it right, and he's actually yeah, he's credited as the producer, not Mark Buntsman. Um, yeah, but the yeah, I I looked up you know since there were only nine, I looked up all of the the movies. Each of them have different stars from the rest, and there's a lot. It's it's a bit of a theme in his filmography of good people, and they're often, you know, at least some of them are, like, working for government agents or ag agencies or cops or vets or something, rescuing hostages, stopping bad guys, and, yeah, you know, um, people say his, his, he didn't do a very good job with, he, w one of them is, is a Jackie Chan movie, and, yeah, people say he did not do a very good job of getting Jackie Chan into, you know, it, his, his was not in the movie that made Jackie Chan a household name. Um, 
yeah, I, I would like, I, I forget which one, but one of them is actually about, yeah, I'll, I'll just really quickly look it up since there are so few and won't take long to find. Um, yeah. Shakedown stars Peter Weller, Sam Elliott, and Richard Brooks, and yeah, um, that does sound really cool. I could, I could totally see a legal attorney and renegade cop team up to stop a corrupt cop. Now, let's see. Yeah, so you know some of the characters and subplots, like the cop and the doctor going on dates. It kind of feels like padding, like they had to get it to feature length, and yeah, it, it is a, a little unfortunate. But yeah, he has a, a very distinct... He's not subtle, and the... the yeah, you know, you're, you're either you're gonna have a reaction. You're either gonna, you know, be like cheering him on, or you're gonna be like, oh, come on, you know, there's no, nobody watches this movie, it's just like, uh, whatever, no, his political views, most of which I disagree with, are very front and center, and I respect that, like, uh, I don't agree with, uh, yeah, I don't agree with them, but I am very much in favor of people expressing their opinions, and you know, it doesn't it doesn't feel like like he doesn't himself quite believe it or something, and you know, he he knew that this movie was gonna like a lot of people, you know, there 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 are a lot of people who hate this movie because they disagree with it politically there are a lot of people who disagree who hate it because they think it's too extreme in what it depicts even though they might politically agree and yeah i i really respect like making a movie that you know a lot of people are going to find really repulsive that takes serious guts and yeah now yeah so plot twists I, I'm not sure I would say the movie has a lot of plot twists. It's not really focused on that kind of thing. But yeah, I would I would definitely say I don't I don't think there's a single like bad plot twist or ones that are just like too easy to figure out. Yeah. Now, the direction, yeah, once again, handled by James Glickenhouse. You know, since Death Wish had already come out before this one in 1974, this could not claim to be the first movie where someone who is not a cop snaps and starts killing people that he feel deserve it. So instead, it tops it by being much more brutal. And the, the, you know, uh, and and uh, a taxi driver had also also come out. James Glickenhouse does uh, has uh, said, you know, yeah. When when people said, oh, it's just Death Wish, he said that he hadn't watched Death Wish. I I don't know if he has in in the time since. And the the you know I I haven't watched Death Wish, so I can't say, but. You know, I, I don't know which I would think is the better movie, but for sure there are differences between them. Right, uh, yeah, and, and Deer Hunter had also come out, which is also about the, the way that the Vietnam War impacts, you know, yeah, how the... the you know, the, there's, the, the, there's that saying that nobody uh, nobody makes it out of war you either die during the war or it destroys your soul and you'll never be the same person after the war and yeah so that also you know 
wasn't the first movie to do that, and Taxi Driver had come out, so it wasn't the first movie where a Vietnam vet, you know, yeah, became violent towards people he felt deserved it. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm briefly going to get into to Taxi Driver. Um, that movie is more of a character study, where this is more about the vigilantism. The, the vigilantism here is more brutal and more plentiful than in, in Taxi Driver, which is also a, a brutal movie, to be sure. Now, let's see. So, yeah, yeah. Deer Hunter had come out, and... and Let's see how many of the. Oh, that's right. This does predate First Blood, the original Rambo movie that came out in 1982. But but yeah, you know, Deer Hunter, and um, I'm just gonna call it Rambo One. Deer Hunter and Rambo One are about how psychologically damaged Vietnam veterans, you know, are. And, and aren't, you know, they're, they're not focused on Vietnam veterans going out and k killing criminals the way that this is. And this movie, you know, it's not an exploitation film by accident. It's an exploitation film because it means to be. And, you know, I think a very strong case could be made that Rambo 1 is... An exploitation film, but I think, I think you could also argue that the people making it didn't mean for that to be the case. It's not, it's not trying to exploit the Vietnam War. war. It's you know, it's trying to kind of help, you know, help people realize what it's like because for a long time the. the you know, Vietnam War vets were really not given the, the, you know, I, I'm not saying that they, you know, the, the, there was, I suppose it still persists, um, there, there's a, a myth about them being, like, spat on and such, which apparently, you know, the, the, Ah, uh, hold on. Did I end up putting... Did I really? Ah, huh, okay. Um, there's a... Oh, right, right. The, the, yeah. Let's see. It is... Yeah. Um, the Renegade Cut video. Rambo Hollywood Vietnam. I, I will link in the description box that talks about the the, the that myth. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not gonna try to restate what he says there. When, you know, yeah, I'll just I'll just link you to the video itself. But even with that said, the the you know the Vietnam War veterans were not given the mental health care that they needed, and. Yeah, the the um, yeah, this movie is not so much about you know the the exploring the 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 people. It's more saying the you know it's, I I would say it's basically saying that it's it's maybe necessary. You know that's that's the point of view that it's espousing that. A, someone who has actual war experience and realizes, you know, only someone who has been in the Vietnam War could recognize that the streets of New York in 1980 were just as bad as, again, I don't agree with that, but that is what the movie is saying. And, uh, you know, yeah, so, so that's why he is cleaning up the streets and no one else is, uh, you know. It, it, it took being a Vietnam War vet and having it close to him, you know, his friend is attacked. 
and let's see. It, yeah, and you know, the movie manages to tap into a primal urge for seeing those who choose evil to face extreme retribution. And yeah, this is not a big studio, it's basically an independent movie, and as such, it goes a lot further than big studios would at the time, because the, the big studios would be like, oh, you can't do that in the movie, people won't watch it then, and yeah, I will talk about how much money it made, so that was very much not the, you know, I, I suppose also, like, once you've made a movie like this, you know, and people see your name on a movie, they're gonna think, oh, like that one, you know, it, you can't exactly put out, like, a romantic comedy, I'm not saying there's something wrong with romantic comedies, you know, from, from this, which makes it interesting that, like, at least one of, like, I feel like the last movie he made was, like, straight up a kid's movie, I'm gonna really quick check, yeah, PG-13 1995 movie, Young Jesse Travels Through Time, trying to stop a bunch of evil, virtual, fight managers from destroying Earth. Yeah, because cause 90s and people were, you know, virtual reality was a big... That's that's kind of amazing that the, the, the virtual, they're, they're virtual, for, yeah, but yeah, that's... That's not an R-rated movie. I I am that's even if I hadn't already read the the rating, based on that description, that's definitely not. So so yeah, that's it's it's pretty it's pretty wild that that after yeah, cause cause his his production company Shapiro Glickenhaus Entertainment is the one that's behind the the R-rated ones as well. So yeah. And yeah. So unlike some other revenge movies, this one does not spend that much time and effort on all of the major targets for the vigilante. The movie basically expects you to hate criminals before going in and really why wouldn't you? They're so despicable, you know, in this movie, no one is stealing bread so they don't starve to death. You know, they are violent, racist, some of them are rapists, and where a number of American movies that want you to hate the rapist make the mistake of having the rape survivor be visually attractive to the audience and or filmed in male gaze, you know, yeah, this movie does not, which, you know, hopefully means that nobody pointed to this movie and said, oh, they were just asking for it, which is a truly idiotic claim. And you can just look at the fact that some rape survivors are children or, you know, senior citizens. I'm, I'm not saying that no one is attracted to senior citizens, but when people say, oh, they were just asking for it, they're referring to young and conventionally attractive uh, women. A lot of the audio is dubbed in later because they were unable to avoid distracting sounds in the onset audio and yeah, I it wasn't something that really bothered me. I've I've seen some people you know, some some people were really bothered by it and yeah, you know. Yeah, that's how some people will feel about it. You can tell it's an independent movie and it is perhaps closer to Roger Corman than Robert Rodriguez, but yeah, it just feels real. Like, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll get more into that. Now, there are movies on lower budgets that look better than this, like one of my favorite movies of all time, 1978 Halloween. But that movie doesn't have the gut punch that this does. A lot of the movie's gore is implied rather than shown. Now, this was likely because of the budget, but it really works for the movie. The, the, the implication is so strong. Like, there was no time in this movie where there was and and it's not it's not like left up to audience interpretation whether or not it happened no 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 for sure it happened we just don't see gore effects uh, a, a lot of the time so there, there is some yeah but the the um uh there was a what was the thing let's see um, right, yeah, there was never a time in this movie where, you know, it implied violence, and I felt 
disappointed that I didn't see it. Like my mind made up for it as you know that that's the that's the idea and yeah that it, it absolutely worked. And let's see, yeah, a lot of the logic in the movie you know basically only makes sense if you agree with the politics and yeah, you know, one you can definitely poke holes in yeah. And let's see. Right, so I have some critic quotes. Too much of the film is the cop going on dates. In 1980, New York was extremely crime written, like the film shows. And then some others say, in 1980, New York was assumed by a lot of people to be extremely crime written. Films, including this one, reflects that misunderstanding. I haven't been able to find any clear sources that that are definitely you know I it's one of those things where I really wish that the people who make the claim make it clear you know uh, I know I myself am not good at this but we gotta get better at sourcing claims like that that are because that is a very provocative claim let's go with that that's you know saying that is and and the movie makes a number of uh, provocative claims, but yeah the the um, let's see there was the um, I wish that the people who made the claim all cited either where they heard it you know and and or maybe made clear whether or not they themselves lived in New York in 1980 because you know that's also the thing like. We used to just accept the the most dominant narrative. We we didn't used to question things like, and and maybe that's why reviews of this, uh, but because yeah, you know, movies just made claims, and you just kind of had to go along with it. You know, they didn't necessarily examine, and they weren't necessarily critical of the claims that they were making. Now. The Exterminator makes for a perverse kind of love letter to some now mostly vanished or nearly varnished areas of New York. The director hates the boring transitionary shots between scenes of characters going from one place to the next, so there aren't really any in this movie, which makes some people say that the movie doesn't feel like this, like one scene leads into the next. And for sure, that, that is something that I also felt like, especially like after a while of this, like the some of the movie is devoted to him getting revenge for the things that, you know, for, for what was done to his friend. However, not all of the people he goes after are related to that. You know, the... the um, let's see. I... I think at least some of the time he is going after a specific gang and it was that gang some of the members of that gang attacked his friend you know so it, you know he wants to get rid of that gang so they can't hurt anybody else you know similar to how Batman fights criminals so that no criminal no no mugger ever kills you know the parents of of a child you know the way that happened to Batman and that is Something I I reference Batman in my nineteen in my review of the 1989 Punisher. I want to say I thought, yeah, I I that's something I quite like about the 1989 Batman. The way that the movie there's a scene where we see, you know, two. Yeah, a, a uh, I forget. I guess like ten year old boy and both of his parents being mugged in an alley, and the way that the movie uses that, what it uses it for, I I quite appreciate it. But I am not gonna go more into detail it in about it in this video. But yeah, exploits in a good way both vigilante flicks and nom flicks. And it's about honor, duty, and fidelity to one another, which, as you can probably guess, are, of course, military ideals. You know, that's, yeah. And, yeah, so the, 
the opening of the movie before we the audience are able to get our bearings at all the movie shows us multiple massive explosions so we're on the back foot immediately and I think the idea is you know it's it's supposed to put us in the mindset of someone traumatized by the Vietnam War like essentially the moment the film itself start running which for the the DVD you know I was like okay so ready about ready to start the movie playing so I go into the you know there's not a you know I have a the the DVD I have is is very basic I think there might be I'm not sure if there are DVD I, I feel like I've heard that there are blu-rays that have a lot of, of um, special features for this movie mine only has the trailer so I went into the, but but one thing it does have is that on the menu you know um, the yeah, I guess if you don't know what you're looking at, you can't necessarily tell that I have the DVD cover behind me. But basically, the cover is of the ah, what's the word? It's it's a it's a guy with a flamethrower, and the the flamethrower is you know there's there's a there's some flame from it. It's not like a huge flame, but yeah, there's a little flame from it. The DVD menu, I'm I'm not sure if it's the exact same image, but something very similar, and the flame and it looks like it's live. It you know it's it's just animation. I'm almost certain, and it's not it's not from the movie. It's some they animated the DVD menu to to make it more pal you know, more uh, even more attractive. I mean, and yeah, the flame is just moving a little. It's the only part of the of the image that is moving at all, but it's it that's pretty cool. I like that a lot. And yeah, um, basically, I went into the menu to, for the for the subtitles, which I already always have on because I'm Danish. You know, I speak and read and write English fluently, but I've been used to subtitles since I was a child. So I, I read once that apparently, in general, in Denmark, we are just used to subtitles, even even on stuff that's in Danish. You know, so yeah, and. The, the, yeah, you know, click for subtitles, click Danish subtitles, and the moment I click Danish subtitles, the movie just started, and the explosion, so that was, yeah, like, I knew that the movie started like that, I didn't know that the movie would start just by me choosing subtitles, but it makes sense, you know, there's nothing else, it, it, it doesn't have alternate audio, for example, so, basically, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah, it has the, the, the trailer, the the subtitles there's a play button and it does also have the uh, what are they called uh, scene selection so I guess they're kind of figuring if you 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 either get subtitles or scene selection but not both but but yeah um, it works really well like once they get back to America it's a lot more calm at first but the the you know yeah I I read some one one there was one negative review where they said that the Vietnam War prologue felt like an afterthought I mean they're entitled to their opinion of course but I completely disagree I I really feel like it, like if, if you I, I don't think there's any version of the the you know that that is yeah that is one thing make sure that you get as uncensored a version of this movie as you can because they they really went hard on it in the you know and that's also like if you watch this in theaters I I think they were able to get basically everything in there but then once home video and like I think also when they show it on TV sometimes it's really censored but but yeah um, let's see what was I um, yeah the the Basically, the movie sets up that, you know, the the Vietnam thing really, you know, it it's deep in John Eastland, uh, the the protagonist, and I th yeah, I think it makes perfect sense to to have it as the, yeah, and the opening titles are a flyby of nighttime New York, yellow text, basic font, 
Some people don't like that it's a country song playing over it, saying it doesn't fit the movie, but the lyrics certainly do, including the chorus, I had to heal it, I had to heal it until I couldn't feel it anymore. And let's be honest, a chunk of the conservative audience for this, you know, they wouldn't like for it to be rock music, which would fit better with how dark and brutal the film is. I think an argument could be made that it's telling us what John is feeling right now. It isn't what he feels once he starts doing the vigil vigilantism. And as such, if the music already fit the vigilantism theme, it would feel weird that he isn't doing vigilantism from the start. Now, let's see. you know, yeah, basically, you know, because, yeah, that's, since it's not always the case. This movie does, you know, the, the Vietnam prologue happens before the opening credits. Once the Vietnam prologue is over, then we get the opening credits, and the movie makes clear they're now in New York, and, yeah, you know, the, the, he basically, he isn't feeling as much of a drive for violence at the start of the, New York scenes, and the movie makes that completely clear, like, there's actually a scene very early on where he and his friend Michael, Michael, yes, Michael Jefferson, they're like, they're feeding birds, you know, the, the, it, it couldn't be more benign and friendly and, and just, like, you know, because the movie could easily have had, like, oh, you know, he still feels like he needs to use a gun, so he goes to the range instead, or, or something, you know, but no, he specifically, like, he isn't violent at the start of the New York scenes. Now, I am not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it does fit with what came before, I, you know, the, the ending, I think, is fine. I I've, I feel like they could have done a, a better, you know, yeah, but it, it could definitely be a lot worse. And there's no Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. And that brings us to the characters. So, uh, the, the acting isn't great, but it's not really what we watch these for, you know, I, yeah, I, already, I, I mentioned movies like Deer Hunter, Taxi Driver, First Blood, those movies have excellent acting. I would compare the, the acting of this more to, like, a slasher movie, you know, it's not, no one's watching it to get, to, to see great acting, I, you know, we maybe expect that today from, you know, but in, in 1980, we just, you know, it was just that movies could now show a lot of violence and gore, and there was an audience for that. And I'm not going to pretend that I'm, you know, I don't watch them as much anymore, but when I was a teenager, I watched a lot of slasher movies, and I still own a lot of slasher movies. And, you know, yeah, I mean, um, I, I quite liked uh, Halloween Ends, which, you know, what's that, a couple months ago? One month, maybe one month ago, actually, to, to, to the day, more or less. You know, so I'm not saying that I'm above it or anything. Now, Robert Ginty, R.I.P., played plays John the Exterminator Eastland. And, right, right, I... One other thing that the, the DVD has is biographies of, you know, the, the lead actors, and it said... Similar to Sid Haig, Harry Dean Stanton, and Char Charles Napier, whether playing a good guy or a bad guy, he's sullen and laconic, as if he held some appalling secret that it was best the world not know. And that does make perfect sense for a Vietnam veteran. And according to IMDb Trivia, Kurt Russell based his character of Snake Plissken from Escape from New York on John Eastland, so that's amazing, and yeah, next time I watch that movie, I'm definitely gonna, you know, keep an eye out for the, the, that was terrible, yeah, um, 
to to you know I'm gonna I'm gonna be comparing them, but it's it's been a couple of years since I last watched that one. And let's see, yeah. Um, one critic said Ginty puts an in an interesting performance because he's very low key and soft spoken. Let's see, and then it says yet he executes thugs in cold blood and with glee. I mean, if we're looking at the methods, yes. But I didn't really, like, gleeful, I wouldn't really say, not, not from the performance, but yeah, from the actions. And, you know, apparently partially inspired by The Punisher, and like classic versions of Frank Castle, John Eastland returned to New York from Nam and traded one war for another. And that is, like, it's, it's, I do still like the 1989 Punisher movie, but if we're talking like an 80s movie with a, with a, yeah, this is, it's, in some ways, this is a better Punisher movie than the 1989 Punisher. And one critic said, 80, every 80s action film starts in Nam. And Christopher George, R.I.P., played, de plays Detective James Dalton, who is looking for the exterminator. He's dating Samantha Egger as Dr. Megan Stewart. And I've, you know, I just want to quote some, some other critics pointed out her role is pretty thankless. And it's like, you know, she was she was in the brood. It's not, you know, she's not someone that, like, I mean, I, it's been years since I watched The Brood, but I remember her as being quite good in that. You know, the, the, um, David Cronenberg doesn't tend to just pick names out of a hat, you know. I, I wouldn't claim that he always gets a great performance out of every single actor, but I'm not sure I've ever felt like one of his casting choices was just, like, completely nonsensical. Now, let's see. And Steve James, R.I.P., played Michael Jefferson, and... Some people have argued that he should be the lead, and he definitely is more... Like, he's he's extremely convincing as someone that actually... You know, I, I honestly, I don't know him from anything else, but he was apparently, like... Let's see... Um, yeah, I'm gonna quote the, the top of his IMDb bio says, Steve James was often cast in action movies as the hero's sidekick, despite usually being a better actor and fighter than the star. Yeah. And I Yeah, I'm I'm I think there is one very specific oh wow. Practiced Fu Jiao Pai. Tiger Claw, Kung Fu, and yeah, he he is really, really kick-ass, and I think there is one very specific reason for why it is not him, you know, why, why this black man does not have the lead, and Robert Ginty, who I'm not saying, you know, I, I think he does do a, a good job in, in this movie. I, I don't think I've seen him in anything else, but... I do think there is one very specific reason for why the black guy who kicks ass does not have the lead role, but the white guy who is not quite as convincing as an ass kicker does have the role. I'm I'm going to I I uh, I there there are aspects where I disagree with the late Michael Jackson. And one thing that I do, yeah, I, I don't think that he was completely factually accurate when he said, it don't matter if you're black or white. And, you know, I, I would say in the 80s, but sadly still there's, there's a lot of resistance from, from a lot of white audience members when black people are given prominent roles and yeah you know and, and it's not that there was nothing but it was usually then then you have to go for stuff like black exploitation which i am not qualified to to speak on i 
I'm not sure I've watched a single one. I haven't been avoiding them. I just, you know. Yeah. And... Right. Um, Mark Buntsman is also has has also passed in the in between and apparently Samuel Jackson appears at some point in this movie but I honestly yeah I, I really don't know what I'm, I'm gonna very briefly see if there's um no doesn't seem like the the Doesn't seem like it's here on YouTube. The the yeah a, a clip where you can see where he is. You know, if you if you know if you have the time code, please put it in the in the comments. And that brings us to the dialogue. So the line "I'll be back" and used as as a threat is actually in this movie and this movie came out before the Terminator so this may well be where James Cameron got the idea certainly I see in the Terminator a lot of the Harlan Ellison Outer Limits episodes soldier and demon with the glass hand so you know James Cameron is not above uh, you know getting ideas from other places a lot of the dialogue isn't great, but, you know, like with the acting, it's not really what we're here for. The writer-director basically, like, a lot of the time seems to think of dialogue as a necessary tool and nothing else. You know, it, it rarely but not never gets across, you know, yeah, like, there's, there's, uh, hold on. Yeah, you know, there, there's some there's some characterization exposition in the dialogue, but it's not necessarily particularly written or delivered well compared to the the shock effect of the vigilantism, which clearly is what James Gilligan Howe is more interested in, you know. And let's see the yeah, there are, there are eight entries in the IMDb quote section and. All of them are good, and yeah, the cinematography was handled by DP Robert M. Baldwin, and let's see. yeah, they they worked together on. Let's, oh wow, I guess, huh? Yeah. So other than this, right? This the soldier and McBain, they worked together on, and he did also. Yeah, he returned for the second movie, and he, you know, yeah, he was DP on Basket Case 2 and Frankenhooker, so, yeah, they must have liked working together, or they would not be, they they must have had a good working relationship, at the very least. Maybe they didn't necessarily, I don't know if they, you know, like each, yeah, like, they're both still alive. Uh, you know, I don't know if they like each other, but certainly they, you know, they, they respected each other's work methods you know so that it's, yeah it's it's not like this guy couldn't have worked on other exploitation movies in the 80s there were an argument could be made that there were maybe one or two other exploitation movies in the 80s other than other than this one but don't hold me to that the yes i'm being sarcastic and yeah, one one critic noted it's cool about the something cool about the film were a couple of shots and edits that were quite unique. And yeah, I think I'm gonna I'm, I have things to say about the cinematography, but they go well with the editing. So I will move ahead into the editing. And yeah, this was edited by Corky O'Hara, who only edited four movies between 1979 and 1986. Um, it's not that the the um, that Corky never again worked, in, you know. The, they're credited as executive in charge of post production on 2002's Love Liza, and special thanks on The Prince of Egypt, 1998. So so yeah, but yeah, um, 
I honestly don't know why the why they didn't edit anything else, but they did also edit Christmas Evil, which from that title I'm gonna go ahead and guess is also an exploitation movie. Yeah, the a lot of the scenes in this movie are filmed with just one camera setup. There's no cross cutting, close ups, coverage. Again, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot. And there, there are several long takes, which really makes it feel like you're actually there. It's almost like a documentary. You're watching something that actually happened, and they happened to, to have a camera on it to make sure people knew that it happened. You know, there's actually, there's this one scene, I, I, I neglected to time it. I, 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 it's somewhere between half a minute and two minutes long. And it is done entirely in a single take. And to keep things interesting, it opens with a long zoom out. It it starts at at first it looks like, oh, it's a it's a shot of the out a shot of the outside of a building, but then it zooms out. And once it's zoomed out zoomed out enough, you see that the camera was you know it was filming through a window, and once it's zoomed all the way out, it's you know, focusing on the characters in the room who were already talking before the camera had zoomed out and it never cuts to a close-up but th there's two characters in the the shot and once it's zoomed all the way out they're basically on opposite edges of the frame and on at least one occasion one of them moves closer to the other and the camera pans and zooms so that both people are clearly visible in the shot but it's more, you know, it's a more personal kind of, you know, basically, one of them is saying, when you say that, what you mean is this, right? You know, that, that kind of thing. So it makes sense to have the, the shot closer. And, yeah, um, very nicely done on, you know, re rehearsing and figuring out the timing and everything, because there's no, like, I mean... Maybe it wasn't the very first take, but nevertheless, like, they have a handful of lines. Uh, if I had to guess, there's maybe a hundred words spoken in the, the scene, and no one stumbles over a line, no one mispronounces anything, and the the timing of everything works to, you know, yeah, and, and actually, I'm not 100% certain if that scene was also dubbed, but certainly... If it were, I did not notice any moment where the um, where the dubbing where the where the words spoken didn't match the the lip movement. So, yeah, very very impressive. Um, the the ah, uh, let's see, what was the thing that um, yeah, you know, it's. It's the, almost the kind of thing that, that like, you know, so, sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. And, yeah, uh, limitations can really make you, you know, and it wasn't, they didn't really try to limit things based on how brutal it was, but they did, you know, only have so much money for it. So, yeah, you know, the, the and, and, yeah, as, as a quick example, like, it if they only the the more the more footage you shoot the longer you have to spend on it the more different angles the more time and you know for that time you have to pay the actors you have to pay the the camera you know all of this stuff and once you get into editing like if all you have to do is grab the right take and stick at a certain point in the movie that's substantially easier than cutting back and forth you know, especially back in the nineteen in in nineteen eighty, like editing was analog. Like if you've never tried that, that is not something I, I have. You know, not not that I'm old enough, but I have worked with technology old enough that, yeah, um, it, ah, I should say. To be clear, I have not edited on an editing setup from nineteen eighty. What I mean is, I once edited a movie where all I had were two VCRs. 
you know, on one VCR was all the footage we shot, and the other VCR was the final, you know, so, so yeah, I had to, every time, every, every footage, all, all the footage that didn't go into the final movie, I had to just, you know, either let play or just fast forward through, hit record when there's footage I want in the movie, and yeah, for that movie, we also made the very wise choice of using long takes and moving the camera and zooming and such to make up for not cutting. Because when we, you know, when we started shooting, we knew that that was what we were going to be able to edit on. So, yeah, you know, if you're editing today, uh, you know, you're, you're very likely editing on digital. You've got fancy software. And, you know, I've, I've also edited some with that. Trust me, it's significantly like you, you, you know, some, some people say, oh, I wish I was just born, you know, X amount of years earlier. Editing on analog was not, yeah, it was, it, you know, if you didn't really either really, really love it or really, really need the money, it's not something that you chose just because, you know, eh, whatever, it's a thing to do. So. Budget and box office. This movie had a budget of two million, and for sure there are times where you can tell they could not afford more of the. Okay, yeah, but they did also manage to put a lot of that money up on screen. You know, it's not a movie where they wasted a ton on stuff that didn't really add that much. Yeah, but it made thirty-five million dollars. In, in box office, which, let's see, so that's 17 times, almost 17 times, its own budget, and yeah, <laughs> you know, the, the, the people have spoken, they want, this was what they wanted at, at the time, for, for sure, and yeah, so this was filmed, uh, well, let's see, yeah, there various places in New York, and some of it was shot in California. The, the Vietnam sequence was not shot in Vietnam, even though apparently, like, the end credits claims that, which is, I mean, I guess there weren't that many fact checkers back then, so yeah, but no, it was filmed, let's see, it's called Indian Dunes, Henry Mayo Drive, Valencia, California, USA, not Vietnam. But yeah, I really don't begrudge them for not going to. Vietnam when they, yeah, but they managed to find several really cool settings, like, there's this one bit where we see a character in a in a phone booth and, like, all around them, I I, I forget exactly, I, I, yeah, one, one critic joked, oh, it's Mad Max all of a sudden, because there's just, everything around is just completely you know it's it's a yeah there's like there's like a building that's collapsed right by it so yeah and it you know that helps makes make the movie's case that New York was you know a hellhole at the time and let's see then you have the yeah uh, there I suppose I won't give away exactly, but there are a couple of other parts where they really filmed it in, like, the, the locations, and, and some of it must be sets. Yeah, they, they found stuff that's legitimately really, really off-putting in the, in, in that it makes you, you know, you, you don't want to be there, but it's not the, the way that you don't, that that you can't bear to watch either, and yeah, the the action includes chases, some physical fights, shooting, and yeah, the the you know it's not it's not like a big action movie kind of thing, but the I mean, it isn't so much, a, I mean, yeah, I suppose the, the fact that a number of scenes only have, like, one camera setup 
you know, back then you really couldn't. Like today, you can do. You know, there there are entire movies that um to today where a lot of it is this one, you know, a, a long take kind. Uh, yeah, you know, found footage stuff. There are action. There are found footage action movies today, but back then you really couldn't do that. Um, and yeah, um, it's it's not really about the the yeah the action as such. It's about the 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 methods he uses and how how brutal those are. And that brings us to the score. So this was scored by composer Joe Renzetti, who has 23 movie credits as composer, the most recent being this year, 2022, and the oldest being 1978. So it, yeah, this was the third movie that he scored. And let's see. Oh, he also scored Child's Play, Basket Case 2 and 3, Frankenhooker, Slaughter of the Innocents. So, yeah, again, someone that had a good working relationship with James Glickenhaus. And let's see, there's also 12 TV credits as composer. And, yeah, um, the music, I gotta say, I don't, a lot of the time I didn't notice it that much, which I suppose means it was doing its job of just fitting, but yeah, there's definitely, there's some really dramatic, and, you know, some, sometimes the, the score will really underline how nasty something is. And, yeah, so the, the pacing, this movie really wastes no time, you know, the, I suppose, especially the vigilantism, but just in general, like, I, I get why people feel like there is, uh, it, it's, um, ah, what's the word? There probably is too much in the movie of the the cop and doctor going on dates, but it isn't actually a like if you sit down and time it, it's not a lot of screen time that's devoted to it. I think why it bothers people is because it does break up the other, you know, and and it's not even that you couldn't have the doctor or you couldn't have the cop. I think some of some really effective stuff is when one or both of them reflect on, you know, they they say, "Wow, that was what was, you know, that was what was happening here. That's what or you know, yeah, that that's what happened here and what the exterminator was was stopping or that's what the exterminator did to the the criminals, you know. But but yeah, the 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 scenes of them just going on dates. I mean, maybe maybe it's saying that the cops and doctors were not doing enough. I th I think because because for sure you know the the movie does think that not enough was was being done. And yeah, um, let's see. Um, yeah, yeah, that is what I have to say about the, yeah, yeah, just as a really quick example, like, you see, you see the attack on, you know, on Michael. Then it cuts to John relaying to Michael's wife what the doctor said about the, uh, you know, his his condition and such, which kind of makes you wonder why they didn't say it to her instead of to him, since he's not actually related and he's not like, you know, it uh, it would be one thing if if Michael was 
a child and John was the legal guardian, but no, there's nothing nothing legal going on here. But yeah, and then the next the very next thing we see is him intimidating a gang member to get information, to, to f track down the ones that attacked Michael so he can get revenge on them. It, it really wastes no time there. And, yeah. The, the, largely, it just... The, the time flies right by. It is an hour and 34 and a half minutes long without end credits, and an hour and 38 minutes long with end credits. And, yeah, you know, yeah, it's probably around 30 minutes. If, if you watch the first 30 minutes and you're not interested in what happens after, I'm not sure the movie is going to do anything after that that's completely going to change your mind. Now, the best element of this movie is definitely how brutal and unflinching it is. I suppose, yeah, I'd have to say the worst aspect is... The, the xenophobia, you know, yeah, John has a black friend, so maybe he's not racist, but the movie definitely thinks that some ethnic groups are more likely to do awful things than others, and just, yeah. And, yeah, the, the worst thing, according to others, is that it, it's in bad taste. And, yeah, before the first time I watched it, I was most worried that the violence would just be numbing. And I don't, you know, the fact that we don't see it, that it's just, you know, our, our minds processing it. And, yeah, it's it's less than 100 minutes. You know, if, if it was, like, really, really long, if I think if this broke two hours, then I think it might have gotten excessive with the, with the violence, if it kept being as violent as it was. And, yeah, the thing I was most looking forward to before the first time I watched it was the, you know, catharsis of seeing bad things done to bad people. And, yeah, the movie definitely exceeds, exceeded my expectations. I suppose I can't, I can't guarantee it that, that, that you'll have the same reaction. The trailer does give at least a little too much away, but this is, you know, you can't really give a, a good idea of what this movie's like without spoiling. And yeah, you know, if you like the trailer, you're much more likely to like the movie than if you don't. And the cover and poster don't give too much away, although don't go into this movie expecting him to just nonstop be wielding a flamethrower, although apparently he does a lot in the second movie. So, you know, maybe they, they were like responding to th that feedback. And, you know, the, the, yeah, this was, this came out at a time when covers and posters just didn't give you that good of an idea of what the movie is like. It's just, they had a really memorable image that, uh, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, um... I did not actually find all that much here on YouTube. Uh, there were three clips. Let's see. Was there really only the one trailer? I'm, I'm just going to double check because I feel like I found... Was there not a modern trailer or fan trailer? Maybe I'm thinking of a, a different movie. Yeah, I guess I was. Okay, yeah. The, the, the trailer... Two TV spots, one tribute, six review analysis, some of which, like, let's see, the... Yeah, some of the, the review analysis, get, you know, there's a couple of podcast episodes. Oh, hold on, did I find them on YouTube, or were they external? Ah, yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but there's a... Yeah, there's a 30-minute... Right, and a 39 and a half minute, although they cover both, both of those videos cover both movies. But yeah, you know, if you want, like, and, and they talk about details and show clips, which, you know, I am not showing clips. 
And yeah, on the tomato meter, it has a 38% based on 13 reviews. The average rating was 4 out of 10, 5 fresh and 8 rotten. And the audience score is 39% based on over 1,000 thousand ratings. The average rating be 3 out of 5. So yeah, rotten for, for both. I gotta say, I was a little surprised that the audience rating was that low, but I think... I've read some negative reviews, and some people ex expected this to be to have more gore than it, it did. And I mean, even even the yeah, I, uh, technically there is more, uh, you know, straight up gore in, for example, uh, Friday the Thirteenth movie from you know yeah the the first one is actually from 1980, so. I, yeah, that was that was what some people were expecting. I even saw one person, and this is this is really cringe. One person actually wrote "non-violent movie," which is just ridiculous. It's not as graphic as other stuff, but saying it's not violent is just wow. You might need therapy, dude. On IMDb, it has a user rating of 5.7 based on 5,854 users. Wow, I really kind of figured more people would have watched it, but yeah. Um, I, I did look at this information before doing this video, but I, I forgot some of it in the meantime. So, the average... the 22.3% the, uh, gave it 6, 18.3% gave it 5, 16.7% gave it 7, 9.3 gave it 8, 9.9 .9 gave it 4, 6.7 gave it 10, 5.9 gave it 3, 4.0 gave it 1, 3.5 gave it 2, and that covers, oh right, and 3.9 gave it, 3.5 gave it 9 also, and you know, I've recently said that there are a limited amount of uh, situations where you should be giving something, for example, a 1. I do, I, I understand giving this a 1. In part, for sure I could see how some people would feel this is not well produced enough. You know, personally, I've already mentioned, you know, I feel like it, it feels like a documentary, but some people will feel that it, you know, it's not polished enough to, to deserve more than a one and some people you know thought, felt that it was unacceptable to show some of the really brutal things that the movie shows and I could also completely understand giving it a one based on that whether you're someone who thinks that bad things should be done to people who do awful things or you know and and you just don't think it should be shown like this or you think that isn't okay yeah, a, a one rating makes sense. There's not a huge amount of special effects in this, but there's there's one that's really amazing, really really well done. And let's see. Um. Yeah. Um. Let's see. That then means. Um, I think, yeah, um, I don't think there's any time when I felt that it would have made a ton of sense for there to be a special effect, and then there wasn't one, like, sometimes you don't see the, a, a graphic, you don't get a graphic view of the thing that is happening, but you'll get, like, you, you won't always get a good look at the aftermath, but, like, sometimes the, the, you know, yeah, for, sh for sure, the, the, it does tend to give you a good idea of what happened and the aftermath. You know, some, sometimes you, you'll hear it described, sometimes you'll see something that gives you a strong idea of, of the aftermath. Yeah. Um, 
and there are some really great stunts a couple of times where someone will you know fly through you know the, the yeah the movie actually starts with someone flying through the air because of an explosion there's not a huge amount of you know when, when you've watched the vietnam sequence you know don't expect the rest of the movie to go as big as as that but yeah there there's a there's a couple of times where someone is is like shot and you know fall or or yeah and the yeah the violence is really again not as graphic as implied but it is quite intense and brings us to let's see yeah so the Yeah, you can stream this on Microsoft and Prime, and yeah, I rate this 7 Brutal Revenge Sprees out of 10, and yeah, uh, I, I, I don't think I'll be watching it again today, but maybe in a couple of days, maybe in a week or something, I'd be, you know, I'd happily watch it again. And that brings us to the spoilers sections, starting with notes taken while watching. Yeah, the budget does really, really show at the start of the film in Vietnam. Very effective decapitation. The fact that his mouth... Like, it, it looks like he's about to say something or, or scream or something, and his eyes, I think, also move a little, or maybe that was maybe that was my imagination f f filling in, but that really makes it horrifying. Like, he, he felt the... F like, his, his brain just barely had time to process what was happening, and that's really just... Yeah. I do agree with those who said that it's a bit too easy for the the slice through the neck and bone. I think it would have looked better if it looked like it was very difficult to it. Maybe even took more than one machete strike, which I think should be like fireman axe hitting a door or something like tough, you know, the but it just kind of, you know, I I saw at least one person say it's like a knife through a hot knife through butter. Yeah, that's definitely what it looks like and that does you know, it it's it takes a little bit away because you're like that's not how easy that would go because there's a spine in there like others I'm not sure why that one Viet Cong caught fire one guy joked that it was a spontaneous human combustion I mean it's a bad guy in an American action movie from the 80s even if it's not a car it's gonna catch on fire and or explode and yeah, you know, I already mentioned in the in the review itself that John and Michael feed birds. You know, John is quite gentle with with Michael when the you know yeah. And let's see, yeah, there's that early part where you know, let's see, it's that they're both going for coffee, and Michael says he'll pay if John takes the heavy load, you know, and yeah, I, I appreciate that he, like, they could have made it that already, he's already, like, barely speaking, but no, he's like, ah, man, I can't believe how heavy this thing is, you know, just, yeah, and let's see, yeah, and, and there's a little blood on his thumb when they're feeding birds, and that reminds him of the decapitation in Vietnam. There, there's a brief flashback. Considering how rare it is for this movie to do these edits, I think it is significant. There's, let's see, there's that other, there's another time where he shoots a guy, and he has a flashback to shooting the guy in Vietnam. I forget if there are more than... There might be one more, but the, yeah, because that 
was more difficult on this old analog editing setup than just these all, all this time where it's just one shot one scene kind of just yeah so yeah it does seem like you know he hasn't really recovered mentally emotionally from Vietnam and the the kind of yeah yeah I think it's significant that it's just it's blood on a thumb like you don't you know what why is um, let's see what's the word if if the if it's that some guy got uh, a cut on his neck that reminding him of the cap decapitation that's like oh yeah I see what you mean it's like oh that could have gone worse kind of thing but blood on his thumb making him think of a decapitation and you know I I think I saw at least some people saying that's kind of goofy why why does that tiny little thing and I guess it's that the birds pecked a hole when it was feeding or something. yeah I don't know. Maybe it's like the spontaneous human combustion in the movie. It it kind of it happens when the movie is trying to do something edgy, you know. Anyway, the the yeah. So I feel like that means that it's still like it's right under the surface with him. And let's see. yeah, and you know, I'm not the first person to note. He did not need to shoot that Viet Cong who was down and in water. He could have just left. You know, maybe, like, at most, like, make sure that he doesn't have a gun on him. Or maybe tie him down and leave for his friends to find. But, you know, this movie was made at a time when America did not have empathy for the Vietnamese people. And, yeah, 23 minutes in, and he's already gotten revenge on the people who attacked Michael. And, yeah, and I think it's significant, the, the line he has when he talks to Michael, and it's actually, you know, he basically, he only really opens up to Michael after, you know, and, and then there at the very, very end, the, the, the cop. But, yeah, you know, he's, like, he, he's talking to, to Michael, nobody else can hear, and he says, it feels like we were back in Nam. It didn't matter if it was right or wrong. I just did it. And we see the attack dog right before the stake date. So when Michael is attacked, John is attacked, we actually knew that, the, yeah. And the mob guy's man checks the bathroom, but John still gets him, having hidden in the trash. And yeah, as others have pointed out, like, how long has he been in there? Because he didn't, like, you know, we don't we don't see him like get in there right after the. Actually, hold on. Was he watching? We see them arrive at the restaurant, and this is a movie that doesn't show a huge amount of like. That's a that's an establishing shot. Like someone's feeling fancy. Wow, did they did they find? You know, did 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 it turn out that that one of the they thought it was a one, but it was actually a hundred dollar bill, and they're like, let's go wild here. And and yeah, the I think I think he might have been standing there watching as they arrive. So yeah, you know the the and the guy is you know aging. He even says you know I have to go to the bathroom before I can start eating. He doesn't put it quite that delicately, but I choose not to repeat his exact words. But but yeah, you know hiding in of in a I, I'm not sure I forget if there if a trash can is ever used, but in some of the later Hitman games you can hide in, you know, body-sized containers, and, you know, he uses a tranquilizing injection, which may have inspired Dexter, and I realize I'm not the first person putting that out. And I quite appreciate he demonstrates the meat grinder to the mob boss before, you know, I, I had forgotten that, but, but yeah, you know, we, we see the meat grinder in effect twice. You know, first he, he grabs, he, he, comes in with a piece of meat, throws it into the grinder, pushes the button, and then it, you know, makes the, the minced meat. Does that mean that Ginty has been mincing? And the, the, then you have the, you know, yeah, later you see a massive amount of minced meat, and, and, yeah, I don't know either why the meat is, you know, there's no, there's no, 
clothes in there, and it's like, I mean, you could have had, like, I mean, we see we see him waking up, and he's, you know, he's he's chained up above, you know, you could have had that, had it that John, you know, took his clothes off, that also really sells the fact that, no, 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 you're not leaving here, this thing, you know, but I guess he was, I think he did maybe claim that he was going to let him go if he told him everything, but yeah. And yeah, the mob boss gives up almost all the information about breaking into his house, and you know, he, he says that the safe is to the right, which, you know, everything in the movie is to the right, so not sure he needed that clarified. And yeah, the attack dog is basically the only thing he doesn't mention and I realize that it's supposed to be that the the attack dog doesn't can't can't tell that he's there until he accidentally kicks the water bowl. But like dogs have a way better sense of smell than humans. In my head canon, that dog was just like okay, I don't know this guy, but live and let live. Am I not merciful? As long as he does not fuck with my sustenance. Whatever. Boss hasn't f fed me recently, anyway. And... Let's see. Yeah, the, the cop goes in to talk to the, the guy whose face was bitten off by rats. And his, like, his face is completely covered with, with bandages. So either that's the guy who indeed had his face chewed off by rats, or maybe that's the Invisible Man. And... Yeah, I think, you know, I already mentioned the dates are probably to say that, you know, oh, these cops and doctors are not doing their jobs. You know, there's even that... Uh, ah, hold on, did I copy that in? I forget if I... Um... Yeah, I'm. It, it won't take long to find the. So I'm just really quickly gonna grab that, or just quote it now. There's a. But yeah, I think the the date thing might also be to say that the cop is good. You know, in in this movie, good people get to. Ah, uh, what's it called? good people get attacked in this movie. At the end of the movie, he's shot by the CIA guy. So, you know, and yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, Glickenhaus has a knack for audacious shifts of mood. He can enhance a basically grim situation by interjecting something incongruously funny. The most astonishing example depicts the aftermath of a death scene in a hospital room. At the sound of an alarm, an empty corridor is suddenly filled with doctors and nurses jolted out of erotic hideaways. Yeah, that was uh, Gary Arnold's uh, review of the... Yeah. Um, let's see. And yeah, and, and the, uh, you know, the cop, I guess I should stop calling him that. He has a name. Uh, let's see. So if I, his name is James, James Dalton. James Dalton, isn't that the... I guess I'm thinking of... Uh, no, yeah. Um, yeah, I googled James Dalton and the top, the, the top hit is Wikipedia. And, yeah, one of the James Daltons. The the one that it... Yeah, it also writes something about a, a footballer. Who lived from 1864, and then it says question mark. So there's some chance that somewhere out there, there is a footballer who is that old. That that would be pretty cool. Um, as long as he wants it that way. I mean, anyway... The first one it lists is The Criminal, the captain of a street robbery gang in 18th century London. Oh! See, I keep... 
So that's not one of the Dalton brothers, then, I guess. Um, yeah, because that was the American Old West. That was what I... The, but maybe... Oh, yeah, yeah, none of them were James. That's right. But, yeah, so... Was he meant to be named after... Maybe he was named after the, the footballer. If you are the footballer and you can prove that you've been alive since 1864, please put it in the comments. That, I... Yeah. Um, I mean, if you live right, they say that you can greatly extend your life as long as you're not in a 1980s exploitation movie. Now, the, let's, right, yeah, the, um, James Dalton, the cop, also, Detective James Dalton, also says, yeah, I was in Vietnam, what, did you think I was at, what was it, Sarah, something, the, the, that school that, is that, let's, wait, was, was the, I've only heard that place mentioned, like, in this movie, and an American Psycho. Now, the yeah, the books from 1991. Is there some chance that that's where he got the the name for? Um, ah, okay, it doesn't have. Okay, I'll just really quickly, because I know that it's in the IMDb trivia. So let's see. Hmm. Um. Yeah. Uh. Wait. Is it maybe? Here we go. Sarah Lawrence College. And I mean, in this movie, they specifically point out there are there are boys who go to Sarah Lawrence College. So, I don't know, I guess, was, is that, I don't know, it might be a complete coincidence. Maybe Brett Easton Ellis doesn't know the movie at all, or something, but yeah. I did feel like that, where did that come, why are people snapping at each other? You know, there's also the bit where she comes in to, to talk to, to, you know, rat meal, rat face, rat meal face. And the, you know, the doctor's like, oh, I didn't think you were next of kin. And it's like, he's a cop, though. I mean, you know that. And, and she does also explain. She's like, ah, you know, I've been working so hard, which is then kind of contradicted when all the doctors and nurses are having sex in the hospital at the... Yeah, because that, that must be because they're on call, right? Because she said she had a night watch. Yeah. Which, I mean, is that supposed to be? I mean, they responded to the alarm. It's not like they stayed there. I, I don't know. I feel like, the if, you know, if you want to say, oh, the you know, they, they're they not taking good enough care of, like, you know, they should be watching patients or something, I, I feel like that was handled better in... I can't believe I'm blanking on the, the name, but I know that it was a Kubrick movie. So it won't take many moments. Clockwork Orange. I think a Clockwork Orange did a better job at that kind of yeah. But anyway, that brings us to let's see. Yeah, you know, basically John is the only good guy to survive, and apparently in some cuts he doesn't. You know, the the thing with the you know, oh, he had a he had a vest on. That's why he could survive getting shot and falling into the water. Not that the vest itself is necessary for swimming. Anyway, the, the you know, I, I don't want you to be so worried that you're walking around with a, you know, permanently with with a, a swimming vest on like that one kid in South Park. Anyway, yeah, you know, in, in some versions, we don't see the bit where he made it out and I get why that would lead some people to think oh he did die at the at the end uh, let's see 
Yeah, so, um... I think a lot of people already know this, so I, I'm just I'm just saying it so that, you know, in case you were confused, the subtitler thought that the word chicken hawk meant gay. It does not. That it is a, it means pedophile. It doesn't mean gay. It's not the fact because because the the woman is like I don't want to have sex with a chicken hawk. And the the subtitler apparently thought that she was homophobic rather than you know. She thinks pedophile, you know, pedophiles are are disgusting. If you have the urges, all I say is, try to get treatment for it. Try to find a way to not give in to them. You know, I, I you lose my empathy if you actually do something to a child. You know, if if you, I've I've heard that some people feel the urge through no fault of their own and for that I just just try to try to find a way to to yeah let's see and I agree with those saying that John wasn't expecting the prostitute to lead him to someone that he could exercise vigilantism on vigilantize I don't think he was all that interested in sex with her. I think he was worried about her, figured that if all he could do to help her was sex and pay for it, then that would be fine. You know, first, she says, you know, it costs 20 plus 5 for the room, and he's not interested. But then she immediately lowers it to 15, which makes him wonder if maybe she struggles to make money, and then he notes that she might catch a cold because she's wearing so little, and... Yeah, you know, I, I feel like at that point he just, like, I don't know, I mean, what was it they said, uh, so and such much money for half an hour, you know, that's half an hour where she isn't on the street freezing and when she isn't having sex with someone that she finds disgusting, so I, I feel like that's what he, you know, and note that once he realizes that she's been tortured, he doesn't seem sexually frustrated, only compassionate, you know. I'm, I think if he... I, I, I want to make it clear, I don't think there's anything wrong with sex work or, you know, what, uh, what is the, I think sex work is work, and we should protect sex workers. The, the, um, let's see, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm delusional here. You can, if you think so, feel free to put it in the comments. In my mind, I feel like if she hadn't, you know, if, if she had taken off her clothes, or, or, you know, yeah, it's when she takes off her top that he sees that she's been tortured. If, you know, and, and know also at first that she thinks that he gets off on her telling him about the, the torture. And there's also, there's that other prostitute who only gives the, the, the um, Detective James Dalton... Alive since 1968, 1864, that's it. You know, well, yeah, there you go. That I don't know why they're wondering if he's still alive. He died in this movie. Anyway, he only gets information from her when she, she gets her fix, you know, which is also saying, you know, oh, all these prostitutes are on drugs, and yeah. Would she... Do people usually carry their fix? When they're when they're like just, I mean, I guess she is in her office, but what if someone stole her purse? Then she has no. Wouldn't doesn't she only f get a fix when she gets all the way home? Why is she carrying drugs? That's also not like he could also arrest her for that. Just yeah, James Glickenhaus's paranoid right wing mind is a fascinating place. To, to yeah but but yeah um, I think that if she you know once she takes her top off he realizes she's been tortured and then his mind is only on revenge I think that if he if she had taken the top off and there wasn't any injury I think he would have just said let's not we, we can just talk for 30 minutes you know you don't you don't have to have sex with me 
But but yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm making him into a complete saint. Yeah, see, the movie got to me. Now he's a saint in, in my mind. <laughs> Again, I'm being sarcastic. Saints don't do the kinds of things that he does. Unless you read the Bible. The, the, the ah, angels do those kinds of things, not, not saints. Seriously, if you haven't read the Bible, it's, it's wild, the kind of violence that it describes, calls for, you know, considers appropriate. We see John ready his weapons. Apparently the thing with Mercury is supposed to make dum-dum bullets, but I've read that isn't actually how you do it, and if you do what he does in the movie, you might, like, the, the pistol might explode in your hand, basically, and yeah. So, you know, don't do it, but in general, don't do what you see in movies, so, yeah. And we see he has newspaper cutouts pinned up so he can find and hurt the people who did it. And other people have already made fun of, like, the, there's one, like, big headline that's like, woman, what was it, jumps to her death or falls to her death, escaping armed thugs, and they were wondering how... How did that happen exactly? And yeah, I I do not know. That is that is a a. I don't think they thought about. It. I think they were just we're just supposed to be like, she fell to her death because of you know these armed you know just yeah. And I appreciate that John makes sure to make it as disgusting as possible when he's talking to the chicken hawk, you know, to make sure the chicken hawk has every chance to express that it's going too far you know he he talks about the age she says that the mother OD'd so there you know he's not gonna have to deal with anyone come looking and at no point you know he doesn't say ah oh, dude that's too young that's disgusting he doesn't say oh I feel so bad for her I feel so bad for them that they no longer have a mother you know I I think that might have been Maybe there should have been something like that for some of the other characters, because you know, once you've seen that, it's like, okay, yeah, um, you know, I think he, yeah, he, he lights him on fire. Still pretty brutal, but I don't, I no longer have empathy for this guy. You know, I mean, I would personally say in real life, you know, arrest him, prosecute him. Although apparently in this, in the wild universe that that this movie exists in, what was it, forty-two counts of sex crimes? a year and a half or something of of jail time wow that is just yeah and I've seen some critics say perhaps you shouldn't light someone on fire in a building that might have people you're trying to save I don't know I guess he's banking on them being flame retardant and the journalist approaches the cop and it's like your presence at this crime scene means that it must be the exterminate I know that's not a direct quote I'm describing her line Evidently, she has deduced that they can't afford another cop actor. And, uh, yeah, they say, oh, it looks like napalm. And then one of them says, oh, that's you know, that's just what happens if you fall asleep with a cigarette in your head. And, and it's just, that was kind of gratuitous, James. I feel like you're, you're kind of just like, again, don't get me wrong. You shouldn't, you know, don't fall asleep smoking. You know, smoking in general is bad for your health, but if you have, like, stress or anxiety, you know, and you don't live in a place where weed is legal, or you just, you're of the mind that tobacco is better for you than weed, which pretty much all the science says is, is bullshit, but, you know, I, I, I personally have never smoked. I don't expect to ever smoke. Not, not tobacco, not anything else, you know. But, yeah, you know, don't, don't smoke, don't, don't fall asleep with a cigarette in your hand, but, like, you know, I, I get it. Some people like a cigarette under certain condition, conditions, you know, post-coitus, for example. Um, I, 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 honestly, if you smoke after sex, you're going too fast. But the, the, that's a terrible joke. Anyway, yeah, um, 
I don't know. I feel like that that maybe should have he maybe should have killed his darlings with with that one. It's just like okay, okay, we get it. And people say liberal movies are preachy. Holy crap! And the cop discusses evidence with the doctor. I mean, I was kind of kidding when they when I said that they couldn't afford another actor to play a cop, but it's like, I mean, he could have said that to the CIA guy, but no, no, he breaks, like, that's, that's pretty illegal, like, the, the, yeah, 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 that's the thing, he doesn't want to work with the CIA guy, and, and there's that thing about, like, the CIA, the CIA, you know, yeah, one of, one of the people is supposed to, like, call the police chief, I don't think the detective James Dalton, you know, the the 116 year old police detective at the time the movie was made. I don't think he ever mentions that. So I, yeah, but again, you know, in his in his paranoid mind. The CIA are looking for people who might be working for the opposition party. It's like, when he mentions they might be working for a foreign government, okay, the CIA, sure. But the opposition party, like... Just, yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure the CIA has never helped a politician as long as the opposition party was in America. That's what the FBI is for. Let's see. And, yeah, and, and you know, the, the, James Dalton is like, ah, oh, you know, there's like, there's 2,000 names in this thing. Like, it's going to take a lot of knocking on doors. And why the fuck are you smiling? And then she's like, oh, wow, sounds hard. Want to go on a date instead? And he's like, oh, yeah. You know, of course. Some people have chosen to describe him in their reviews as ridiculously horny. Yeah, he must be. Like, I mean, even if he's not, like, if he doesn't really disapprove of what the exterminator does, like, at least try to find him and then, like, talk to him. Because that's also the thing, like, the ending... It seems like he kind of, sort of, doesn't mind. Like, he says, you know, I, I love his, I love his um, one-liner, but, like, the, the thing of, um, hold on. I have it written down somewhere, don't I? Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, you know. Epic one-liner about, you know, I think you need to take a shit. It's coming out of your mouth instead of your asshole. And the the that's when he when the CIA guy says you're you know, the the yeah, he, he says the thing I just quoted about you know, opposition party, possibly a foreign government. I mean that's obviously bullshit. That's ridiculous. But does he agree with the with, with John I don't know maybe I missed a line I I it's entirely possible that I missed a line where he explicitly says whether or not he he trusts you know yeah uh, let's see. yeah and and like when you know when they meet on the uh, was it a boat or something like that you know he fires a gun, like, right off to the side of, you know, of the cop. First of all, what if the cop, you know, thought that he was aiming at him and tries to jump out of the way, jumps into the bullet? That's one thing. Another is, what if he does have some kind of, or what if he, what if someone did come with him? You know, like, if, if he did s tell someone, okay, please follow me just in case something happens, Obviously, that guy is going to try to stop John from shooting when he's just, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. I don't know why John threatens the motorcyclist. Like, if he thought that, you know, I, I, I'm not certain he saw enough to be sure that the motorcyclist wasn't hurting the old lady. 
but then why does he just threaten him instead of actually hurt him? He doesn't, you know, he doesn't kill him. He doesn't do anything to him. He, he threatens him and takes his motorcycle, and that's it. You know, like, if he thought... Has he left anyone... Right, uh, Ratmeal Face is still alive, I think, although he apparently, like, he can't regain consciousness, or he can't... Like, the... the the cop and the doctor agree that he can't get anything useful out of him, so, yeah. Uh, let's see, and, um, okay, so, so, you know, and, and yeah, for sure, if he doesn't think that the motorcyclist did anything wrong, why is he threatening him? Like, the, the motor, like, even if he needs the motorcycle, and, and see, again, it's so easy, just have him say, I'll bring the bike back, but I gotta take out those guys, or something like that, you know. And now John is just going after muggers who engage in reckless driving. I'm sorry, but I feel like that's a downgrade from chicken hawks, mob bosses, and like all this, just, what do you, what do you, you just, yeah. And, let's see. And, and like, you know, I, I'm not saying that the scene can't be in the movie. I just feel like it should have been earlier, you know, maybe before he goes after the chicken hawk, for example. But, but yeah, you know, then when, when the... Oh, right, yeah, I, uh, I said chicken. I guess not all chicken hawks are pedophiles, but some of them, you know, help pedophiles have sex with underage people. That, yeah, to be clear. And, and that's also incredibly disgusting. In, in both cases, yeah. Um, and why does he let the car drive... Like, he shoots one of them. And let's drive the car drive... Like, I guess it's so that they can have a chase, and so he can even... Like, he he crashes the motorcycle, they don't crash the car, and then he almost... You know, but he does manage to, to get them. But that's really forced. Like, and it's... You could have just had it be that he... You know, he pulls up to the car, and there's only one person in the car, shoots that person... And he doesn't know where the other muggers are. They were in the car when they drove off. And then they drive up in another car behind him and chase him or something like that. But, or, or wait, or he, ch yeah, right, The as it is in the movie, he's the one chasing them. Yeah, yeah, you could, yeah, that's right. So they drive off in another car from, from in front of where he is, so he chases after something like that. But just, yeah, I don't know if James Glickenhouse does more than one draft. And, uh, let's see, yeah, um, so, yeah, we have the epic one-liner. Yeah, it's cool enough that it, it bears repeating. I think you need to take a shit. It's coming out of your mouth instead of your asshole. And then he goes on a date with Meg instead of trying to work against the guy. It's like, if you think that this guy is, like, going off to the wrong guy. Aren't you worried that he's going to kill John, then? Like, why are you why are you taking time off for a date when you could just... Wild. Now, I am in favor of euthanasia, but I do think it is interesting that this movie, not to mention many conservatives who have written reviews and comments on reviews defending the movie's depiction of euthanasia, don't seem to think that Michael's wife should have any impact on the decision. Even if they didn't want to film a scene of that kind of thing, of a discussion between John and the wife of Michael, just have John say, I already talked to your wife, and she says to grant it if that is what you want. You know, he he tells her afterwards, he doesn't give her any chance to argue for Mar Michael to go on living. Just, like, I get it. I... And, and it's also, you know, today it's considered extremely offensive to imply that if you... If you're either going to be disabled or dead, that, you know, yeah, you, um, yeah, just, just saying, saying in a movie that it's better to be dead than disabled, you know, it's really, really close to you, not, not euthanasia, but eugenics, and that's, I really hope I don't have to explain to anyone why eugenics is bad, but, Let's see. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he's like, I mean, if if you'd rather... And, and it's also, did the doctors say that when they told him that he want That, that you know, when, when they told John, Michael wants to see you, did they say, I think he wants you then? 
you know, kind of thing. I, th I think that's why he's, you know, because, like, let's be honest, the doctors in this movie would do that. How did he know for a fact that, that it was, like, I, I guess the fact that he would be willing to, which I also, is that as a thing... Yeah, and anyway, the, the, yeah, you know what, if the, actually, no, I'm not qualified to speak on that, so I am gonna shut right the fuck up, um, about that, not about, uh, I mean, if you really badly want me to shut the fuck up, I guess, you know, you can turn off the video, but anyway, the, the, yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, you know, um, Michael figured that John would be willing to, you know, do the, the euthanasia, even though the, the doctors might not. And, yeah, so, you know, he asks him directly, I'll, I'll do it if, if you're sure, but, you know, um, blink your eyes once for yes and, and twice for no. And, you know, Michael blinks twice. Yes, yes. As you wish. If, and others have already pointed out that John could have performed the euthanasia in a much less harsh way. Michael is going to feel every second of dying from not receiving any air. When Michael could have used a knife to, like, stab him in the heart or maybe shoot him in the head, in the brain, uh, you know, um, it's just, uh, uh, possibly stab through the eye, because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of something that wouldn't attract attention, because obviously a gunshot would. I feel like I've heard that you can stab someone in the brain through the, the eye, but otherwise, you know, there's a lot of, you know, the, the cranium is, you know, yeah, you, you can't just, like, stab someone in the, in the head and immediately break through, as far as I understand, at least. Now, let's see, you know, I suppose some might consider that murder, even though both actions lead to Michael's death. And... Let's see. That guy who just came down the hall, I think he was the exterminator. I mean, okay, I wish he cleaned up after himself, but okay. And John sees the cops driving away from his place, snipers posted on the building. He's still on the motorcycle. I guess he just straight up kept it from that guy. Does he know something about the motorcyclist that we don't? Something that means he deserves to lose the bike, though he tried to help the old woman? Is it just because he wouldn't actually fight the muggers? I mean, if he doesn't think he can win, is it a good idea for him to... I mean, if they really badly wanted John to get a motorcycle, why not have it be... One of the people he exterminates had a motorcycle. You're telling me there's no chance that the mob boss collected motorcycles? Like, come on. I'm not saying that I think he drives motorcycles. I'm, th I'm saying rich people collect all kinds of crap they're never going to use. Especially the rich people who are rich because they're somebody that inherited or took, uh, you know, the, either they themselves inherited people or... Uh, took advantage of people, or they inherited from someone who took advantage of people. I'm sorry, I I know I'm supposed to pretend that there's any other kind of rich person than those two, but just, yeah. And I do appreciate that they make it completely obvious that there's no way that John himself shot Detective James Dalton, who looks incredible for you know, a 116-year-old. Because, you know, he, he was about to give the gun to James, which also makes me wonder if the sniper was maybe like, oh, dude, if you give the gun to James, he's going to shoot you. I won't let that happen. I'll shoot him and then you. But, yeah, you know, because he was, he was about to give the gun over and he was like, you know, the like his... his um, yeah, you know, he was, the way he was holding the gun, there's no way the, the bullet could have, you know, not even Oliver Stone could have thought that, like, magic bullet kind of, thing. anyway. How did one bullet blow up that car? Like, I, you, you, 
you can just have other things like just have him like put a push a detonator and then we see the the car blow up just yeah and like did i see that right did john manage to shoot the sniper with that handgun from that far away and and shoot him like lethal just yeah and apparently the bullet that kills dalton is actually from some off-screen person so and that's also like couldn't you just have had the sniper finish him off and then john maybe john and, and the sniper fire the last bullet at the same time kind of thing and yeah we see john had a vest on and made it out and a country song over the end credits it's not the same as the opening but it is similar and it again like yeah actually come to think of it like the opening song f it kind of fits the idea of you know he's trying to just live a normal life the ending credits song kind of implies that he's retiring from exterminating which I mean he wasn't done I do think that the movie could have benefited from like I mean the at the start Michael is attacked uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go over the entire sequence of events. We all know, you know, if you watch this far into the video, hopefully you know the plot of this movie. Hopefully you've watched it at least once. Yeah, you know, once Michael is attacked by the ghetto ghouls, and and uh, and John goes to kill the ghetto ghouls, at least the one those ones. I forget. Did he keep killing ghetto ghouls over more of the movie? Anyway. You could have made it that the head of the Ghetto Ghouls, and as apparently in the second one, they do have a main villain. I think this movie would have benefited from a main villain, and have it be that, although, I don't know, maybe James Glickenhouse was worried that would imply that the crime was over at the end of the movie if he kills him at the end of the, anyway. But yeah, you know, the fact that he attacks people, because the Chicken Hawk, that could have been a subsidiary of the the ghetto ghoul mob boss maybe the ghetto ghoul mob boss could have been the one that oh wait yeah ah uh, hold on yeah yeah like the guy who got lowered into the and and ground up into burger meat i think that should maybe have been like the under boss kind of you know and then at the end like the the guy who is behind it all you know the let's see um yeah you know the at, at, you know, by the by the end it becomes clear to you know he figures out how uh, you know who know yeah he figures out that john is the exterminator maybe he was also having sex in the in the hospital there and uh, that really, that is a baffling, like, of all the ways they could have it be revealed, just, you know, flies open, and then he zips it up, and he's like, oh, well, that's the guy. Euth you know, vigilante, euthanasist, polite, you know, enough to tell you that your fly is open, the exterminator. But the, that should be the tagline. As, as it is, the, the, you know, let's see. Oh, right, there's, yeah, there's six taglines. They are really, really good. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it should note that, you know, yeah. Uh, let's see. Yes, so, yeah. And the ending, and, and if you really want to, wanna, you know, uh, uh, what's it called, like, twist the blade, you could have him, like, say, I'm glad you lost Vietnam, uh, let's see, maybe he thinks that the, the, um, what's it called, yeah, what's that, what's that Con Air line, uh, um, fucking pussy, you know, it, yeah, he could say, it's because of people like you, we lost Vietnam, you fucking pussy. So, something like that, you know. I love that movie. That that one I do legitimately. I, I acknowledge that the, the politics are definitely, you know, very conservative. But I do find that movie extremely entertaining to watch. Anyway, yeah. So the... Uh, let's see. Um, I think... 
Um, I don't know if I want to think. I guess maybe the the CIA person is the. Could it? Or maybe, yeah, maybe make it that he is a, a politician, that the, the guy behind it all. Because they have that thing where, like, the, you know, was it, did they just say Washington or something, you know, was asking the mob boss to fix the, the meat price, which is also an interesting, like, and he's, like, he can do it, but it's going to take some, some work and cost him money or something. It's, yeah. Very, very interesting how how James Clickenhouse, at least when he made this movie, felt that things worked in New York. But yeah, yeah, you know, make it make it like um, yeah, yeah, because you already have you know the, I I forget was it the yeah yeah the 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 guy that he shoots at the at the chicken place you know the. The, yeah, he sets fire to the chicken hawk, and then he kills the, the other guy. Was that, like, a senator or something? Or I, I feel like we heard that, that, was, that he was a politician. So, yeah, you know, make it that the, the main politician... Maybe they're even related, or, like, they were running mates. So he has a, you know, he has a... Uh, secretary position or something, you know. And, uh, yeah, you know, and at the end, he manages to, to figure out who it is, or maybe he, you know, yeah, you know, the, the thing about the CIA listening in, you know, that's, that's fine. As it is, I think it would have been better if the movie, let's see, um, I mean, I guess I get, I, I guess you'd have to get rid of the, the thing with the, okay, yeah, here's my rewrite. Instead of a good cop, the guy who tries to find, uh, you know, it, it could still be the, you know, you just change the character. He's actually a bad guy. He's working with the, 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 the senator and the, the secretary. And he pretends to, you know, he, yeah, he pretends to be a good guy. So he maybe lures John into this, you know, really abandoned place. And John realizes that it's a trap, shoots the cop, and then there's some kind of, I don't know, I guess maybe a physical fight, or maybe maybe they try to shoot each other or something, you know, between John and the secretary. Or maybe the senator should be, and the secretary should be the, the pedophile. But anyway, yeah, one way or the other, you know, yeah, end it like that, or have it be... You know, just this thing of, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe he sends another letter to the the news, you know, and they read aloud a, a manifesto, and that's it. You know, there, there are vigilante films that end with a manifesto, and I think that might have worked better than, than the, you know, I, I get it. He does say to Dalton, that's what it's about. You know, not, now you know what it's like to feel like a victim, that's what it's all about, you know, so, and, and that is, uh, you know, um, basically what he's saying is, they victimize people, I want them to feel the, the pain and fear that their victims do, you know, and, yeah, that definitely works as a, uh, what's the word, if you, you know, if you, as, as a, as why he's doing it, you know, that, again, that means he does have empathy. He just doesn't have empathy for his enemies. And again, you know, yeah, they're they're monsters. So, but but yeah, he does have empathy for their victims. And yeah. So that brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. I totally understand why they made a sequel to this. If I heard it was good, I might want to watch it, but yeah, I I hear it's bad. I do think it's really cool that uh, John Ginty came back for, for... Did I mispronounce his name? Um, no, that is it. John Robert Ginty playing John. Return. I, yeah, I knew there was something wrong. Um, let's see... 
Yeah, and they apparently, like, did, did, they made, um, I'm gonna find real quick. There's a, there's a, uh, hold on. So the the yeah there's a there's a oh from this year actually a um, oh about the son of John Eastland yeah um, the exterminator retribution fifty one minutes long was that meant as a short film or was it supposed to be that kind of sounds like a, a failed pilot. Um, does not look like yeah if if it is a failed pilot i can't see as a but yeah i mean that makes sense as a as a sequel and there's also something from 2020 called exterminator but that's a horror it's a horror short film yeah it does not look like this is based on the the cover has like a guy standing on a man-sized mouse trap, and there's a creepy woman's face overlaid. Yeah, yeah, this is a horror movie about a person who treats other people like bugs or you know something. That is also interesting. When I did research for this movie, one thing that came out came up was, and this might not surprise you if you're already. Yeah, the the 1973, you know, no the, but Exterminator, explanation park. 1973 short story collection by William S. Burroughs, which made me laugh because based on this movie, you know, I'd be surprised if James Clayton House wasn't homophobic and William S. Burroughs, I haven't read, you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing a video on Naked Lunch, and that's why I've done some research on him, even though at first I was like, there is no way I can do this guy justice, because I do not know, you know, but apparently he is very, very, like, the, the, he describes gay sex in a way that a lot of people could not really handle, so, yeah, it's, it's funny to me that some people might actually, yeah, and there's actually, there's a, yeah, 1960 book called The Exterminator, and that's, let's see, I can't tell if that's the same, but that's a short story collection by William S. Burroughs, so, so yeah. Um, let's see, so, so yeah, um, kind of, kind of, maybe, yeah, um, anyway, the, um, yeah, I, f I feel like, um, I feel like you could probably make this kind of thing work, like if someone wanted to do a reboot, um, yeah, I, f I feel like I, th I mean, s certainly some action movies today are extremely gory, uh, you know, the Expendables movies have uh, substantial gore, in it. it's some of them, not... I feel like there's at least one of them that's like PT-13. Wait, did I? No, that can't... Hold on for just a second. That... Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I might be thinking of something else. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I feel like they could they could do The Exterminator today. I guess maybe not New York City. I don't know how popular it is to today say that it's this really awful place. And certainly, you know, a number of people are going to criticize if you make, yeah. Um, but but yeah, like I feel like you could just have it be, you know, he goes, yeah, just make make it a nondescript city, you know, and just. Yeah, you know whether yeah, you it could be it could be a movie, it could be like um, you know I mean I just got done watching season one of the Punisher of the Marvel Netflix Punisher, so yeah, um, Netflix, you know, 
you could you could do it there as a yeah um, yeah honestly if if the if that went to to Disney Plus via Star or something I would I would consider watching it for for sure and you know I mean today anything that has made money as a movie or TV show or something you know there's some chance that it'll get a, a resurgence you know the yeah so the yeah so some IMDb trivia the infamous beheading at the start of the movie cost $25,000 to shoot in order to achieve the gruesome beheading in the Vietnam scene a full-sized dummy with graphic facial expressions was built by makeup effects artist Stan Winston, R.I.P. That man was just an immense talent. Um, yeah, so you know, you if if you feel like you recognize his name, but you're not sure, yeah, the Terminator, for example, but both Terminator. I'm pretty sure he did Terminator Two as well. Uh, let's see, instead of doing it this way, I am gonna look up. Yeah, yeah, he worked on both of the. Terminator movies. I'm so glad that they never made more than two of those. I'm sure a third one would have been complete garbage. I just, I still do think there are some, not not the third one, but some of the other sequels, uh, you know. But yeah, I've done entire videos talking about them, so I'm not going to here. The Vietnam sequence cost $400,000 to film, which was 20% of the movie's budget of two million, the opening Vietnam uh, right, and I actually I heard some those. Um, I'm not sure if it's a theory or an actual thing, but apparently, back the, yeah, what what I heard. I'm not gonna claim that it's for sure. I, it could, if it's true, then it's definitely at least part of the explanation. But yeah, apparently, if you sat through the first 10 minutes of a movie, then you couldn't demand your money back. And so they made sure that there was a lot of action in the first 10 minutes. The opening Vietnam scene filmed at Indian Dunes National Park in California was the same location where Vic Morrow and two child extras were tragically later killed on the John Landis Time Out segment of Twilight Zone, the movie. The fatal scene with Vic Morrow and two child extras was also set in Vietnam. And yeah, uh, this is a, quite a good uh, critic quote. I feel the film is very black and white in its presentation of bad and good. It's an exploitation movie from the 80s. As such, its villains are painted with the broadest strokes possible without subtle nuance to ensure we side with the anti hero. Let's see. So yeah, you know, the film has a pervasive bleakness, bitterness, lack of hope. Some of the other movies were a man with serious training wages a war of his own against bad people from the 80s. The Terminator, Commando, you know, uh, Rambo 2. And honestly, let's include, you know, 1991's Universal Soldier. There's a very clear end goal. Like, it might seem while you're watching a movie like The Good Guys, one of these movies, The Good Guys will fail. But there's some chance they will succeed. With this movie, we don't even really know what success would look like. He's never going to stop killing criminals. And he kills the ones that attacked his friend very early in this. You know, he isn't even on a specific single mind mission to take out everyone related to them the way that a number of Punisher stories do. And, you know, yeah, uh, um, Max Payne, you know, he kills people that aren't... Um, yeah, that, that didn't kill his family, but they're involved in the overall conspiracy. And it's not as well that there's a conspiracy, that's confirmed pretty much immediately. So, yeah, you know, that is also something that, that can really work. You know, I, I don't, I've, I've played through both of the real Max Payne games twice, and yeah, more than more than twice, and I have also played my way through the the third Max Payne game. But yeah, the first two, you know, there's never there there's no level that just feels like well, what this came out of nowhere? What where? How did we get here? Which is sometimes the the feeling you get in this, you know, yeah, 
at, at times in this, you really don't, you know, how did he, we, we see him, like, start to subdue a guy, and then, you know, cut, and it's just, you know, yeah, anyway. And, yeah, we see, you know, the police investigate Eastman, but the CIA are more worried about him than the monsters he kills. The government worry about covering their own ass. And, let's see. Yeah, the, I already mentioned the ending itself is somewhat underwhelming. I wish they had a set piece similar to how the movie started. It doesn't have to be big, but something. The movie, so, so the movie, you know, yeah, the movie as it is doesn't so much end as stop. You know, like, be honest. If I told you, if, if, if like, if footage emerged that showed that there was at least one more scene after the end of this movie, you know, that they, they filmed and maybe they didn't have quite the money to complete it or something, or it got cut for some reason, would you not be like, yeah, honestly, I could see that. Like, there are so many movies, you know, it, yeah, actually, honestly, um, so yeah, I mentioned Terminator, it, yeah, Terminator, Terminator 1 and 2, Commando, Rambo 2, Universal Soldier, if I found out that there was another scene after the ending of of any of these, I'd be like, no way, what? That would not seem just, you know, maybe an alternate ending, okay, but an actual scene after, and, and with this, it's like, I don't think it's that they just ran out of money, but it looks like it might be that, you know, and just, yeah, um... You know, just if, if they had saved some money and just have, like, a big explosion. Maybe he fakes his death. Maybe he and the, you know, yeah. There's the, the, there's the politician there that he, he kills. And he, like, causes an explosion to fake his own death. And then it's like, okay, maybe he considers it done. Or maybe he just needs, like, a break. Or maybe he's going to go somewhere else. Or... Maybe he just wants people to think they're, that it's a different one so they don't, you know, in case his identity gets out something, you know. But as it is, it's just like, you know, yeah. Um, I, I get, you know, as it is, you could say he does fake his death, you know, sure. But I don't think it had to be just this, that it didn't, like, yeah. Um... And, and it really doesn't feel like, I mean, the last time he kills someone who chooses evil, you know what, I actually, uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look it up on the, let's see, so the, let's see, um, Um, let's see. Is that? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I could, maybe I'm mistaken, but certainly going by the Wikipedia plot summary, the last time he kills an evil person, you know, okay, yeah, so the CIA sniper there at the end, but he wasn't trying to, you know, that's just as a self-defense. This is not a guy who usually acts in self-defense, you know, he takes the fight to them, basically. Yeah, he kills three members of the ghetto ghouls after witnessing them rob an elderly woman. That, yeah, and he actually took a break from, you know, the ghetto ghouls, because, yeah, because the, the, um... The mob boss has nothing to do with the ghetto ghouls, right? Because he, yeah, yeah, because like um, the warehouse, the with the with the beer and all that, they pay protection money to the mob boss, so there's no reason for the ghetto ghouls to steal from the yeah, yeah. So it's it's completely, you know, he takes a break from the ghetto ghouls after the the, and it also just I. The fact that the that we have no idea how he captures the the that one gang member, like it cuts, 
you know, we, we see him talk to, to the wife and tell her what exactly, you know, what, what, the, what the diagnosis is and such. And then it cuts, and then he already has a guy tied up when, you know, a scene or two ago, he could barely fight off. Like, you know, it, it was... It was the, the it, you know, the reason that he made it through that other fight with them was that Michael helped him. And let's see... Um, yeah, I, um, I really think it, it, like, yeah, the last chunk of the, maybe the last 20 minutes of the movie, I don't think he, yeah, yeah there's the, the CIA guy, otherwise I don't think he kills anyone, so, so, yeah, it's, uh, well, you know, Michael, but, again, that is euthanasia, Michael himself did Say so, yeah, I I I do think that he should have talked to the the wife before, you know. But I don't think that someone should be forced to live if they if their life is in a state where they wish that they would die. Um, right. And I also just real quick, I saw someone say that Michael and John only became friends in the opening scene or something I'm pretty sure they're supposed to be like aren't they serving together I don't know I I could be wrong but that was the the vibe I got from watching the movie but yeah um let's see um When Eastland is is putting ghetto ghouls, which is also just a hilarious, and and they listen to Disco Inferno, which makes them substantially less intimidating. But I don't know. That's, wait, were conservatives against disco music too? Maybe. maybe. I, I yeah, I gotta say, and and also like we see some of the party, and like one of the ghetto ghouls is like with two women and they're like topless i think and is it supposed to be like an like ah oh, they're attacking the nuclear family he wants two women not just one because it's like i mean they, they they giggle they don't seem like it doesn't seem like it's i don't know if i missed uh, a hint that it's sexual assault please let me know in in the comments and i will try to be more vigilant in the future but as far as I could tell, it was, you know, all, everyone present enjoyed it, but yeah, I know conservatives, they don't, what, what was it that, you know, the, the, ah, uh, let's see, there was that guy, ah, crap, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, uh, radio, uh, hold on, I know a quote of his, maybe I can find it by that. Rush Limbaugh, yeah, so, you know, Rush Limbaugh, let's see, he, yes, he did die, and it was, I want to say, let's see, yeah, yeah, uh, he got lung cancer, and that was something that, yeah, um, let's see, he was diagnosed with it January 20, 2020, and then he died just, yeah, a little over a year later at the age of 70. So, yeah, um, the, the, let's see. Um, yeah, the, the, um, let's see, yeah, yeah, you know, he had previously downplayed the link between smoking and cancer death, saying, arguing, it, uh, it takes 50 years to kill people if it does, 
which you know so so that's part of the the irony there and it also just like he was a radio personality if you believe in God and you believe God punishes bad people and then you get lung cancer after being on the radio for a very long time I feel like that might be a hint that God thinks you took it a little too far oh he was he's in a cemetery in st. Louis Missouri yeah. I mean no I, I I have a bathroom in the house so but but yeah the the um, crap I completely forgot what was uh, let's see Rush Limbaugh um, okay that, nope that was nothing uh, just something fell but it wasn't something that took damage um let's see crap I completely 100% forgot where I was going with the um hmm there was something that Limbaugh said that I was gonna be referencing ah uh, let's see right that's it yes okay phew yes what li you know yeah lim yes if the ghetto ghouls you know it didn't seem like they were you know it's it's just I don't know maybe maybe the disco inferno scene wasn't about how the, the, the I forget if that's the song but the disco song maybe it wasn't trying to say that they were doing something wrong right now but it feels like every single other scene where we see someone who chooses evil they are engaging in evil activities you know there's no scene of these people just you know the the yeah um, so so yeah I know that even if the the ghetto ghouls were trying to to rape these young women that that wouldn't necessarily be you know that doesn't bother all conservatives certainly uh, you know as as I mentioned it's it appeared to me that everyone in the room had consented to what was going on but you know consent doesn't mean the world to all conservatives Rush Limbaugh joked that if consent is violated we bring out the rape police as if that would be a bad thing like as it is the police really don't do enough when there's actual rape you know there's this huge backlog of rape kits and it's like if you're not gonna test if you're not gonna work with the rape kit don't force the woman to go through you know a, the only the only explanation for why you would force a woman who has been raped to go through a rape kit the the procedure and then not work you not use it to try to find the guy is if you like the fact that she was raped and you want her to be raped again because that is you know it's it's another violation and just yeah so on that note i am closing the video so yeah uh if the let's see if you made it this far into the video thank you let me know what is your favorite vigilante movie what you know yeah do you have sequel ideas for this you know i already talked about how i could definitely see them do you know yeah, you could you could have like a multiple season show and each season he goes to a different place maybe and you know the the crime there is based on that specific place or something. And I acknowledge again that you could really get into a lot of trouble. You know, yeah, I I just watched the the um yeah, before watching the movie, I watched the the pitch meeting for the new um, Top Gun movie, you know, and he said that if they don't say what country it is, 
they're more likely to not... I, f I think he mentioned that Twitter would definitely get angry. Yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, now that people have Twitter, you have to be careful about what place you say is bad. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it murdered your best friend. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists. I suggested a video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus Star Wars show, which these days is Andor. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. And remember, if, if you say something stupid, it might be because you need to take a shit because it's coming out of your mouth instead of your asshole.